So I'm going to take what Thomas talked about and actually try to uh, use a specific example of thwarted belongingness and perceived burdensomeness and talk about it in the context, one specific context, that's the context of suicidal adolescents and their parents. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to take five minutes to talk and I'm going to show you a five minute segment of a tape from our clinical trial in Philadelphia. And what I want to do is try to convey the phenomenology. What does it look like when kids in psychotherapy, suicidal kids, feel like they're not connected, that they're alone within the most special context, which is their family? And also, just talk for one minute about how we target this in treatment. Thomas talked about uh, that as well. So why is it so important to talk about suicidal adolescents' relationships with their parents? Um, you know, one reason is because it's a risk factor. It's a predictor. We know that some of the things that predict at least suicidal ideation and suicidal attempts, if not completed suicides, is conflict with parents, intense parental criticism, uh, low levels of parental care. All of those have been linked with those two factors, and there's a lot of research. It's a very robust finding. The second reason is because we know that good relationships between adolescents and their parents is probably a protective factor. So if I ask you about adolescents and relationships between kids and their parents during adolescence, I am, what would your associations be? Probably things like conflict, storm and stress, separation, individuation, pushing away, yelling, screaming, slamming the door, things like that. What I can tell you is that that characterization of those kinds of relationships during adolescence are not, um, they don't represent optimal adolescent development. They're based on probably clinical examples from early psychoanalytic writings of people who saw cases where their kids were in distress. But fortunately, we have now 20, 30 years of excellent epidemiological uh, normative development research which shows us that kids who function well, kids who have meaningful relationships with their friends, kids who do well in school, um, kids who know how to make sense of their feelings and what's going on with them, they actually have good relationships with their parents even during adolescence. They might not tell their parents that and they would never let them know, but they admire their parents, they care about them, they respect them, they have shared values, core va values. But the most important thing I want to say is that these high-functioning adolescents, which are about 75% of all adolescents, they report that when they're in high levels of distress around meaningful things in their life, such as being ostracized at school or about breaking up uh, from a romantic partner, they will go to their parents and they will signal that they're in distress, they will talk to their parents about it, and their parents will be able to soothe them, and they report this as a very important um, protective factor for them, okay? And the research also shows that good parent-adolescent relationships actually moderates the link between various life stresses and suicidal ideation and attempts. I don't know if there's anything been done on actual completions. Have I convinced you that relationships with parents among adolescents is important? Okay. Okay. So if you, you know, maybe the next question is, and I gave a little bit of a, of a teaser, what is it about adolescents' relationships with their parents and the quality of those relationships that um, links things like thwarted belongingness um, to suicide? So the first thing is this. You know, kids, as Thomas attested to, not just kids, but anybody, you can feel like you want to die for many, many different reasons. You can feel like you want to die because um, you're not respected, you don't feel like you're important at work, in your family. You can feel like you want to die or that you can't take it anymore because uh, at school, all the kids have decided they're not going to talk to you anymore or because you're failing at school 
or because you know this woman or man that you or boy that you loved has left you for the person next to you. There's many, many different reasons why kids feel this desire, this pain. When they go home and there's thwarted belongingness, they feel like they're completely alone with this. Nobody understands. They're not part of something bigger. That just adds pain to the pain. There's a compounding effect. So not only do I feel like I want to die, but I'm alone with this. I'm watching everybody else in my living room, walking around, having good relations, enjoying the television, and nobody sees me and nobody can help me. So there's this pain uh, that is superimposed on another type of pain. So that's one mechanism, perhaps, that negative relationships and thwarted belongingness with parents um, may be a predictor of suicide. The second one is the inverse of that or the converse of that. So not only am I alone with this and nobody can help me, but I can't use my parents as a resource as many other people can do. What happens when an adolescent or anybody else is in distress? Hopefully they go to people who are close to them and they talk about it. And, the, and in the context of these conversations, they do all kinds of important things. They do emotional processing. They learn other perspectives. Eventually when they understand what's going on inside of them, they can also develop better strategies to get their needs met. It's a very complicated and important context. And, in, and it's what we use to develop these socio um, cognitive, emotional skills to regulate ourselves when we're not in that context anymore. So I don't have the benefit of the resource of my parents to soothe me. And the third thing here is what I just said. Not only don't they soothe me in the moment, but because I don't have those kinds of conversations in soothing, I don't learn how it's done. I can't internalize it and take it with me, and I can't use it in the world when I'm not near my parents. And then the fourth reason why um, thwarted belongingness and lack of connection with parents is so important in the context of suicide is that parents are around their kids at many different times during the day. They might not in absolute terms spend as many minutes with their kids as the peers do because as you all know as kids go move into adolescence they want to spend time with their friends and not with their parents but their parents are there in the morning often when they wake up they're there when they come home from school after they failed a test. They're there before they go to bed at night. And if there's some degree of connection and kids communicate, uh, parents have a unique window and are able to monitor their kids' well-being and can, can be, uh, I don't know what the terminology is, uh, gatekeepers maybe, um, to know first when something has changed. So for all four of those reasons and all four of those, these are purported mechanisms. We haven't scientifically tested each of them, but they're probably all true to some extent. Okay. So if parents are important to kids and the degree that kids feel like they can speak to and share their pain with their parents and feel connected is important, then how do we, when we use ABFT, attachment-based family therapy, try to promote connection and decrease the, the degree that adolescents feel like they're a burden on their parents? A lot of times kids won't go to their parents because they're like, my parent is depressed herself, she works two jobs, she's got uh, another kid who's got um, developmental disorders, I don't want to put more weight on, we once had a kid in one of our trials who said my mother's like a cup and the water is filled to the top of the cup. And if I come to her and tell her that I want to die or that I feel so bad, that last drop is going to knock the cup over and it's going to completely um, empty. So this is a very common experience. I think that's, you know, re re that's representative of this uh, fear of being a burden. So what do we do in this little therapy that we've been working on? It's very simple. We work with kids individually and help them articulate this very pain that they've not been able to communicate up until now, in part because there hasn't been a context, there hasn't been a sufficient level of safety and connectedness. Two, we help prepare parents to respond to their kids in a way that will promote them um, disclosing and opening up because intimacy and mutual um, disclosure is what promotes close relationships. Um, so we help them respond in a way that's curious, empathic, and open. We help parents to explicitly show uh, that they want to know what's going on with their kid instead of avoiding what's going on with their kid. We, um, we help them explicitly uh, express 
their capacity to hold their child's pain without collapsing, okay, that they're strong enough. We help them avoid doing all those things that parents do that shut kids down and don't allow them to disclose and then lead to them feeling disconnected. Parents, all of us have a million ways that we block uh, listening to other people's pain. We immediately jump to problem solving. Sometimes we lecture them. Sometimes we criticize them for not doing enough to help themselves. There's a million different kinds of ways. Um, but by doing this, by helping the kid articulate and disclose and the parent respond in a positive way, what we do is we change the interactions in the, in the dyad. The kid becomes more disclosing. The parent uh, responds in a more open, caring, curious way. The kid feels heard and seen. Uh, this is thought to lead to changes in the representation, meaning I f I'm more worthwhile, my parent uh, cares about me, and represent representations and parents as well. My mother is strong enough to hear my pain, and all of that together increases the likelihood that in the future, during times of severe distress, when that level of desirability to die goes up, the parents instead of go, uh, the adolescents instead of going to kill themselves, are going to go to their parent and talk with them, okay? So that's everything I have to say.